The Ring is the first episode of Angel I would probably call one of my candy episodes, a major letdown after the wonderful Prodigal. It's definitively filler, steeped in tedious cliché and wasting many of the potential ethical questions it raises. But you remember how this was the first time we got to meet Lila? Oh, and Angel's cheesy movie dialogue and the bit Wesley does with the badge? <laughs> That's good. Cordy and Wesley are adorably bickering when a roughed-up gentleman walks through the door saying his brother has been kidnapped by demons. Angel follows the clues and ends up in a sewer attacked by howler demons with fancy duds. I started to wonder how demons always manage to have such fancy ceremonial threads. Is there a demon Sears? The howlers point Angel to a bar, and it's there that he meets Lila for the first time. The bar hosts an underground fight club, which features fights between captive demons. Angel finds his way backstage, where the suit and his brother Apples take him captive as a fighter. I asked for a room with a view. Spouting cheesy movie dialogue has become a staple of Angel's, and I totally dig it. But whenever Angel cracks wise, it feels just a little bit out of character. Then again, maybe he lets the Angelus show a bit when he's in dire situations. All of the demons have bracelets which disintegrate them if they cross a red line. Barring that, they have no choice but to win 21 matches or be killed in the process. I'm not killing anyone. <laughs> and you'll be killed. Cordy and Wesley realize something is up, and we get more of the Wesley slapstick that I love so much as they head out to find him. The prisoners banter about Gruel, and we learn that Griff is the grumpy badass prisoner of the bunch. The fight card comes up, and the tiny kid demon Angel defended is fighting Armadillo Head. Angel is fighting a random. Wesley follows Angel's trail, and we see again he's actually incredibly skilled and hampered almost entirely by his own self-confidence. Lila bargains with the suit for the deed to Angel's leash as he prolongs a fight as long as he can, essentially until the opponent walks into the blade himself. He tries to get the other fighters to agree not to kill anyone. One lucky kill don't make you an expert. That wasn't the first life I've taken. Or the 21st. Ah, there it is. Angel grabs Brother Apples and drags him across the line. The rest of the fighters sit passively and refuse to help. Apples' brother Suit pulls a gun and shoots him. How do you like them apples? <laughs> Lila offers Angel freedom in return for leaving the fighting ring alone, a chance to do good in exchange for a little bit of evil. He refuses Lila's bargain and chooses to return to the ring, which wins him the respect of the other prisoners. Wesley and Cordelia devise a way to open the controlling wristbands. Suit makes Angel fight Armadillo Head, and just when he's about to win, Angel refuses to make the kill which finally convinces the Drell to fight for him. Armadillo Head refuses the kill as well. Just when it appears they're both about to be executed, the Drell incites a riot with the rest of the prisoners. The Ring was written by Howard Gordon, who also penned Expecting and Hero, neither of which I was particularly a fan of. And the episode is assembled entirely of cliches, lacking almost any original thought of its own. Almost. The most notable influence on the episode is obviously Spartacus, though it seems a strange coincidence that Ridley Scott's Gladiator released three months later and was one of the year's biggest films. But there are also bits that feel familiar from Fight Club, The Shawshank Redemption, and Battle Royale. The other slaves who don't understand why he won't fight... Why don't you fight? We all have to fight. What's wrong with you? Don't be rocking the boat. This is life and death in here. The noble hero eventually wins their respect through an act of bravery or sacrifice. Want a cold one, Andy? No, thanks. It was a good fight. The good guy ends up in the final battle, has the chance to win, but gives up, and his sacrifice leads to the rally and freedom of the slaves. Or death, or both. Of course, none of the other stories I've mentioned invented those tropes either, but when you retravel material that has been done with considerably more art and spectacle, while not bringing anything new to the fiction, it invites too much comparison. And comparing the ring to anything makes it feel campy, small, and stagey. What the episode might have had going for it was the Buffyverse-style subversion of the idea that demons are the enslaved that have their rights taken away, and humans are the evil ones. You're a girl. And it isn't just the brothers manifesting evil, but the attendees to the barbaric spectacle. It isn't the first time we've seen this, of course. The idea of the good demon appeared in Becoming Part 1 with Whistler. You're not a vampire. A demon. Technically. I mean, I'm not a bad guy. And the supernatural moral ambiguity carried on with Doyle. <laughs> 
Moral supernatural ambiguity is something both Buffy and Angel have been playing with this season, especially on Buffy with the initiative, Oz, and Riley's breakdown at Willie's Demon Bar. You know me, I'm all for thematic complexity, but I have two problems here. The first is that the episode hangs Angel's entire internal struggle on whether or not he's willing to kill another demon. And in both shows, Angel has killed dozens and dozens of demons. But neither he nor Buffy have been willing to kill a human, no matter how nefarious they are, except in the act of self-defense which creates a monstrous, pun intended, difference in the value of a demon life versus a human life. Even here, where the two brothers descend into the depths of mustache-twirling supervillains, devoid of any hint of character ambivalence, Angel still won't kill a human. One brother shoots the other brother, and Angel lets Armadillo Head toss the suit through the security field. Angel being forced to kill another demon in combat is played as a big emotional moment, and yet, at the very end of the episode, they go for a gag that negates any of the weight his situation may have presented him to begin with. If it had been a human he had had to face, maybe magically or mechanically enhanced, I think the weight of Angel's dilemma would have been much more interesting to watch, and tied into the themes the show is already grappling with with Angelus. The human wouldn't even really have to be magically enhanced, just wanting to kill Angel. As it is, nothing particularly new or interesting comes of the episode's moral questions in this one, especially given it undercutting itself in the final minutes. We set the captives free. <laughs> Well, actually, didn't we send a bunch of demons free? Oh, uh, well, uh, technically, yes. There ends up not really being a theme to this one, just a little bit of not-all-demons-are-bad universe building that we already knew. And the suit's double-cross with the episode's lack of apparent theme essentially render the first ten minutes of the episode irrelevant. It's written with the same sort of noir detectivenessness as the rest of the season, with a clue leading Angel to the bookie and then to the sewer, but because there's no mystery here and the rest of the episode shifts in tone completely to the gladiator story, the opening all feels pretty irrelevant. And yet... I actually like this episode, because there's one thing it does really, really well. And you guys know it's one of my favorite things. Show them your badge. And write down their license plate number 439er. Chemistry. Doesn't make the episode great, but it makes it incredibly watchable for me. I once said of Buffy I would watch an episode comprised of the gang standing in a line at the DMV, or doing laundry together. And I find Angel the series is getting there. Angel, Cordy, and Wes may have been injected into a bad stagey Spartacus, but I've come to love Angel, Cordy, and Wes. Enough that this is still fun for me. Cordy and Wesley's bickering... It's a demon database. What would you call it? I don't know. How about... Demon database. And that turns into real support and camaraderie later on is a joy to watch. And the three shot of them leaving the ring at the end of the episode is the first moment where they've felt like an actual team in the process. Aesthetically, I also kind of love the lighting in this one. Whoever got to decorate this season has been having a lot of fun. Season one by design has lacked much of an arc, but the trappings of an arc driven show are already here. Doyle had a wonderful little story. Cordelia has already shown massive signs of change. Angel was somewhat lost at the beginning of the season but has found a calling and done so through his connections with other people. And now, Lila and the continued appearances of Wolfram and Hart introduce another persistent arc-like element to the show, the Big Bad. In their scene together, Lila tries to save Angel from the ring, to do a little evil in order to have all the good he might be able to do. And Angel is stoically unwilling to compromise. I was reminded of Faith's conversation with Buffy in Season 3. But it happens... Anyways, how many people do you think we've saved by now? Thousands? And didn't you stop the world from ending? Just something to keep in mind. It's lighter fare compared to the capable somnambulist or the very good prodigal, but that's okay. While every stroke except for the team's chemistry feels borrowed from something that did it better, when the credits roll, I feel like I had a good time. And I'm excited to see where these growing nice. relationships will take us. It was a good fight. You open your mouth again, I'll close it for good. Stream of silver in the dark, looping, diving. So fast the eye can't follow. After like the squeal of a child fighting against the water, they fly over the black of the sea bed like birds, plumed with the light of heaven. Thinks he can get out of this by pulling a gun. 